Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. And God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guilt guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a, a list on my phone, and maybe you have something similar. I'd like to read a, a few of the items on that list. <clears throat> Clean out fridge if mold throw away. Sweep up loose cat food before cats eat it. Wash dishes, replace garage doorknob, take down Christmas tree. My wife lovingly put this list together so that I would know exactly what is expected of me as a husband around the house. And this is what's known as a, as a honey-do list. And if you perhaps notice by the fact that take down the Christmas tree is still on that list, I am running a bit behind. The problem that I have is by the time the weekend rolls around, the, the last thing that I want to do is complete a laundry list of chores. These tasks are are all that stands between me and relaxation. And, and I've gotten to the point where I've started to resent them a little bit. The bowls, they, they sit in the sink, accusing me as I grab a clean plate out of the cabinet. The cats gleefully gobble up their cat food that they've spread around the kitchen for easy access. And the Christmas tree sits in my garage, mocking me every time I pull in my car. Don't ask why the tree is in the garage. That's a whole other story. But I realized recently that I, I had the wrong perspective on this list of chores. I was viewing them as a, as a burden, a list of do's and, and don'ts designed to keep me from, from fun and, and freedom. But what they really are is a way for me to, to show my wife that I love her and that I care about our life together. If I'm honest, my life really is better when I do these things. I can focus better, I can, I can find the things I need, I can actually relax. And so instead of seeing this as a list of chores, I am trying to see this as a guide for a relationship. Today I want to encourage us to have a similar perspective shift about a different list of do's and don'ts, the Ten Commandments. Now this famous honey-do list was given to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. And all in all, God gave the Israelites 613 laws. But these 10 words, as they are called, stick out as the most important, the most timeless commands. So what do they say? If you open up your hymnal in the pew in front of you, and you open up to page 321, that's 321, you'll find a list. I'll give you some time to pull it up now. <clears throat> 
Now at the top, you'll see that the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. This is the first commandment for a reason, because this commandment sums up the entire rest of the law. Luther explains that this means that you should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. When we fear, love, and trust God, the rest of the commandments fall into place. You don't steal when you trust that God will provide. You don't murder when you love God who made all life. You honor the Sabbath when you fear God, holding him in appropriate reverence and respect. Sin, then, happens when we, when we fear, love, and trust in other things above God, whether that's trusting in money or, or fearing social pressure or loving ourselves more than God and our neighbor. The second commandment you'll see there is, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. God has given us his name to, to pray, praise, and give thanks. And when we claim to speak for God, when we don't, or we use his name inappropriately, we break that commandment. The third commandment is, remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh he rested. We keep this commandment, to, we keep this commandment when we take time out of our week to physically rest from our work, but also to spiritually rest and to receive God's good gifts in worship. The fourth commandment is honor your father and your mother. When you were a, a kid, your father and your mother, they were your first authorities. But when you grew up, you found yourself under other people who have been put in charge of you. Honor and respect them too. The fifth commandment is, you shall not murder. Jesus ex explains that this does not just apply to literally killing, but any hate, hatred or resentment of other people. Instead, we should help and support others in their physical needs. The sixth commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. God created sex, and it is good, but he designed it to take place within a marriage between a man and a woman. It's like fire. It's great in the fireplace, but bad once it gets into the rest of the living room. The seventh commandment is, you shall not steal. Our neighbors have possessions, and we should protect them and not take them or gain them in a dishonest way. The eighth commandment is, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And this doesn't just have to do with lying or a court of law. This commandment is about protecting your neighbor's reputation. Don't speak badly about others. Instead, try to put the best construction on them to others as much as possible. The ninth and 10th commandment are about coveting your neighbor's possessions, relationships, and animals. And this is the only commandment that deals explicitly with your, with your thoughts, but it shows that all the commandments are really heart issues, as Jesus explained in his Sermon on the Mount. Now for some these commandments represent everything that is wrong with faith. A big, mean God telling us what to do. And our modern American sensibilities tell us that rules are oppression, and oppression must be avoided at all costs. Talk of God's law is trying to, to bring religion into where it's not supposed to be. Real life. And this is problematic because faith is meant to be lived out. And God gave us these words to help humanity, ignoring them is certainly not going to bring us prosperity. For others, these commandments exist solely to show us how horrible we are and to make us guilty. As I went through that list, did you feel a, a twinge of guilt at any point? Maybe a, a feeling that perhaps you did not fully satisfy that commandment. Hold on to that for now. We'll come back to that. But but it is problematic if all these laws do is show us our sin, because then that means that we don't really have to follow them. We're just being set up to fail. <coughs> well, there's another way to view these commandments, and it's the way that God has actually given to the Israelites. The ten words actually start with God reminding them that he is their God, the God who brought them out of Egypt, who rescued them from slavery. This is no stranger imposing rules from afar. This is their God. And God says that he is a jealous God, 
which means that he loves his people and he desires to be their, their one and only. In fact, many times in both the Old and the New Testament, God's people are described as his bride. God desires a relationship with his people, one of love and faithfulness. These Ten Commandments are not a list of chores or or tasks designed to oppress us or to set us up for failure. These ten words are a guide for a relationship, first with God and then with one another. I, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but But every one of these words, every one of these commandments, actually involves relationships. The first three are all about our relationship with God. Will he be our only God? Will we honor his name? Will we receive his gifts? The second seven are all about our relationship with each other. Will we respect authority? Will we care for each other? Will we be faithful in marriage? Will we steal each other's stuff? Will we speak poorly of one another? Will we envy our neighbor? Following these words leads to harmony and healthy relationships. Breaking them destroys relationships and community. These are no arbitrary rules. These are ways to show God that we love him. These are ways to actually achieve life together with God and with one another. And that's why Jesus says that the sum of the law is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. The law is about love, which is why so many in the Old Testament talk about the goodness of God's law, how it is a treasure, a gift. And yet for us, it is often a curse. Remember how I said to hang on to those feelings of guilt that the law dug up? Well, it's wrong to assume that the law exists only to make us feel bad. It does legitimately make us feel bad because we fail to live up to it. And it is precisely because the law is good that it matters when we break it. God built the world with these moral laws in mind just as much as he put the laws of physics into place. And when we, when we break God's commandments, we go against the grain of the universe. We destroy human community and we sever our relationship with God. The guilt that you feel comes from the knowledge that you have failed to meet God's expectations. And you only have yourself to blame. After all, which of God's good laws would you abolish? We turn the law from a gift into a curse. It becomes a burden. But the problem is not the law. The problem is us. God's law is his guide to a good relationship with him. He could have chosen to abandon us and conclude that it is simply not possible for the one holy God to have a relationship with a sinful people. But God takes his promises seriously. He promised at Sinai that for those who love him and keep his commandments, he would not abandon them, but show them steadfast, faithful love for a thousand generations. Now, none of us could keep his commandments perfectly, so God sent one who could, his own son. The son of God was born a human like us, and yet unlike us, he followed all of God's commandments without failure. And by doing so, he did what has not been possible since the days of Adam and Eve. He maintained an unbroken relationship between humanity and God. And unfortunately, instead of embracing Jesus' ways, the, the rest of humanity despised Jesus and sought to kill him. Along the way, we broke many commandments. The scribes and Pharisees envied Jesus' power and his followers. That's the ninth and tenth commandment. Judas took 30 pieces of silver to betray Christ. That's the seventh commandment. The leaders of the Pharisees bore false witness in the Jewish ruling council. That's the eighth commandment. They accused Jesus of blasphemy while themselves blaspheming God. Second commandment. They delivered him over to Pontius Pilate to be unjustly crucified. Fifth commandment. And they feared, loved, and trusted themselves more than the Son of God. That's the first 
Through our sin came Jesus' death. Yet in his death, Jesus did something truly remarkable. He bore the weight of all of our sins. He bore the weight of the entire law, and he took the consequences of the law upon himself. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That relationship between God the Father and Jesus was severed because that's what sin does. It separates us from God, and it breaks our relationship with him, and that's what happened to Christ on the cross. But by taking our sin on himself and enduring that abandonment and death, he earned for us salvation. He was raised from the dead, vindicated, and now all who place their trust in him find their relationship with God restored. This is not merely a a wiping clean of the slate. This is a fundamental change to reality. That day, Christ shifted the grain of the universe so that the way to a right relationship with God was no longer through the law, but through the gospel. Christ became the way, the truth, and the life, so that whoever trusts in him will find themselves under the steadfast love and faithfulness of God. God promised at Sinai that for the sake of one, only one, who loved him and kept his commandments, he would show his love for a thousand generations. I looked up how many generations it has been in these past 2,000 years since Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And apparently it has been anywhere between 75 and 90 generations. We haven't even broken 100 yet. God's love is so far from running out, and indeed it never will. Because of Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and you are in right relationship with your God. I said earlier that I I wanted to change our perspective on the law. The law is no longer a a prerequisite to our relationship with God. Because of Jesus, the, the curse of the law is lifted. And that means that it's possible to once again consider the law as a gift. The Ten Commandments are not a list of things that you need to do to be good enough for God, but they are still a guide for our life together with God and one another. Without the pressure of obedience, we can find a new obedience in light of the gospel that comes out of freedom, love, and thankfulness of what God has done. I think of it a bit like this. I love my wife unconditionally, and she loves me unconditionally, at least as much as humanly possible. Now, if I fail to do my honey-do list, will she still love me? Well, absolutely. Absolutely she will. Does that mean that I actually don't have to do that list? I almost, I half expected her to shout out no from the pews. Of course not. If I decided that because she promised to always love me, I can just lounge on the couch and leave the dishes in the sink and the, the tree in the garage and the cat food on the ground, well, no, of course not. Those things don't make her love me, but they are opportunities for me to show my love for her. And that's how the law is for us baptized, forgiven Christians. Think about what our community would look like if we all strove to follow God's law, not to be good enough, but because we are free to do so by grace. A community with with no gossip means that we can freely trust one another and discuss what we're really struggling with. A community who cares for our needs of body and soul helps us all to better trust in God to provide. A community under the authority of Christ and his leaders means no division or factions. A community that has no other gods means that that community is not only a community, but a church. I pray that by the grace of God, we continue to be shaped and molded into exactly that kind of church community as we live under the grace and forgiveness of Christ. In his name, amen.